welcome uh, to Strategist Live uh, online panel discussion about the EU programs to combat the pandemic in Eastern Partnership countries. First, uh, let me introduce our distinguished guests. Uh, Stefan Schleuning, Head of Cooperation and Delegation of the European Union to Ukraine. Natia Turnava, uh, Minister of Economy and Sustainable Development of Georgia. And Jerwin Willems, Deputy Head of Unit European Commission for Neighborhood and Enlargement Negotiations. Welcome. So we just don't have a picture of uh, Minister Tunava. I do have any. So let's 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 start with the uh, with the you, Jerin. Um, what do you think are the key challenges for the Eastern Partnership countries' economy as a result of COVID pandemic? The key challenges are many for the economy because what we are witnessing. In the short term, of course, is a health pandemic, as we are all doing it now, because we're having this meeting in lockdown mode. So everyone is uh, uh, having a discussion from their home. But that is just the start of the crisis. What is unfortunately ahead of us, and um, it only takes a cursory glance at looking at what uh, IMF is predicting for the economies to come, is uh, a massive recession um, similar to what we have not seen until maybe the early 20s uh, of the last century. Um, and so we need to find a way to support all the six Eastern partner countries as much as we need to find a way to support the European Union, coping not just in the short term with the health crisis, but also in the short, in the medium and long term with coping with the socio-economic impact uh, of this crisis, which is massive. And do you think that um, a, the current situation would strengthen the economical relations with the Eastern Partnership countries between Europe and those countries? Um, I think that the current situation shows, and I hope it does, I hope particularly to hear that also from, uh, from the Deputy Minister in, uh, in Georgia, uh, that the EU is uh, showing very strong solidarity. I think that uh, what we have been doing over the last few weeks and months in very peculiar circumstances, because we're all were in lockdown mode, is to reorient um, and reprogram our assistance to make it fit for purpose for um, responding to this pandemic. So, of course, again, in the short term, supporting uh, health, we have put in place a massive package uh, to strengthen uh, basic health needs uh, throughout the six Eastern Partnership countries with hopefully the first deliveries of basic equipments coming in in the coming weeks, but continuing in the coming months. But most importantly, we have been focusing on the longer term socio-economic uh, impact. Uh, so putting in place uh, programs that provide necessary liquidity to small and medium-sized companies that are the backbone of all the economies in the EU, as well as in the Eastern Partnership. And they will have a tough time uh, once the lockdowns start to ease to have enough uh, financial flows to keep uh, their business going. So having access to the liquidity is really key. Uh, and we have been topping up a huge amount of funds uh, to, make this, uh, to make this happen. Uh, in addition, there's the macroeconomic situation keeping the inflation under control, keeping the, the macroeconomic stability, providing macro financial assistance to a number of uh, Eastern Partnership countries. And also we've been uh, supporting uh, civil society um, in reaching out to the most vulnerable groups, but also working on disinformation. Now, um, I think uh, uh, this will all, uh, I think, be very helpful in trying to mitigate the socio-economic impact. Of course, we also hope that this will strengthen further economic ties between the EU and the Eastern Partnership. But our first and foremost uh, objective at the moment is to support our neighborhood countries and make sure that they, they are resilient. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, uh, Mr. Nava, thank you for coming and welcome again. And uh, we would like uh, to know what are the key challenges for Georgia specifically uh, in course of uh, COVID pandemic? Uh, did you experience uh, mainly economic challenges? Uh, good afternoon. Hello, everyone. First of all, thank you very much for this excellent opportunity. I would like to extend our gratitude toward 
the strategist, the host of this online uh, discussions. It's an excellent opportunity to exchange our views on the recent developments. Uh, coming back to your question uh, regarding key challenges for Georgian economy. So as a Minister of Economy, I would like, of course, to speak first and mainly about economic challenges. And uh, of course, like in many other countries, uh, COVID-19 pandemic has interrupted uh, Georgia's positive economic trajectory, uh, which is PT, of course. Already in March 2020, uh, the negative economic growth was observed and mounted to minus 2.7%, while in January, before pandemic, when the globe, the world already experienced uh, the, 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 the pandemic, uh, we uh, still had a rate of growth of 5.1%. As well, during 2019, economic growth was strong amounting to 5.1%, which is uh, much higher than, than in our neighborhood. Um, it is already obvious that due to the pandemic, world is heading into recession. And Georgia is not an exemption, of course. We are very much globalized country with a liberal economy, with a free trade agreements, uh, with a more than 30 countries. and. Uh, it's a unions of countries. So that's why, of course, we, we are also affected like, like many other countries in the world. Um, we expect a sharp contraction in economic activity during uh, second and third quarters of 2020, uh, which will be followed by a gradual recovery, hopefully. Uh, at the end of the year, growth is projected at minus 4% uh, according to International Monetary Fund uh, and just recently EBRD, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, published even more um, pessimistic forecast minus 5.5 and the main um, rationale behind that is that situation with pandemic in the region where we are situated is not that good, not that promising and it once again it means that uh, uh, irrespective of the success of one particular single country, we are facing with a global challenge. So we are very much interrelated. Uh, so again, we do expect that in 2021, we'll be able to uh, rebound gradually and to reach at least 4% of growth uh, as tourism and external, external demand gradually recover after the COVID pandemic. So if speaking about particular ways of how Georgian economy was affected and is affected, coronavirus outbreak negatively affects economies through numerous channels and uh, including sharp declines in domestic demand, uh, lower tourism and business travel, trade and production linkages, uh, supply disruptions and health effects, but for Georgia, the most important channels through which Georgian economy will be affected is the tourism and business travel, of course. Uh, tourism represents one of the fastest growing industry in recent years and uh, each year in uh, our uh, gross domestic product uh, is around, was around 11.5% in 2019. Uh, of course, because of pandemic travel restrictions and uh, prevention measures, uh, tourism arrivals and uh, receipts are expected to decline very sharply. Nevertheless, Georgia is um, among those countries which announce the precise timeline for opening of touristic market for international travelers from June 1st. Uh, our hospitality industry, which obtained, I would say, unique uh, experience of safe operations due to uh, participation in a massive Quarantine, quarantine program, uh, our uh, hospitality industry will be able to host first foreign tourists within so-called safe corridors. We're working very hardly in this direction with the particular countries, with the regions. Um, we responded to COVID-19 outbreak in various ways and tried to mitigate negative economic impact of pandemic 
First, uh, like many other countries, we focused on our citizens' health and safety in order to prevent growth rate of infected persons and elevate pressure from a healthcare system. Uh, by introducing the measures at early stage, we managed, uh, we managed to avoid the peak. So our peak was not that sharp, but more moderate, moderate curve, moderate dynamic. Uh, currently, uh, the number of new cases is fluttering, while number of recovered continues to increase sharply. Uh, having uh, the one of the lowest death rate in the world, I would say today we can say that for this stage we have stopped spreading and essentially defeated the pandemic. Of course, it's a very, uh, let's say, moderate optimism, but we have some reasons for this and ground for this optimism. Uh, improved epidemiological situation has allowed us to gradually open up the economy. Uh, as for the anti-crisis actions, significant measures were already taken to minimize economic costs, support business sector activities and vulnerable groups of, uh, of the society. Uh, government introduced economic support package that includes various fiscal, monetary, financial, structural, social and business support measures. Uh, our aim is to support private sector and improve social safety nets uh, in a limited time frame. The initial support measures included the postpone postponement of uh, property and income taxes for the businesses, not only for SMEs, but for the sectoral um, uh, corporations and businesses, for tourism and related sectors. Uh, we managed to agree with the commercial banks to delay bank loan payments for entrepreneurs and citizens for three months, uh, provision of interest subsidy uh, from our side within, within the program Enterprise Georgia. Uh, besides, government fully covered utility payments uh, for the households for three months. Um, it was a, not only vulnerable households, but I would say more than 70% of uh, uh, utility payers' households were like um, free from utility payments for next three months. And by doing this, we, we, in one hand, we uh, supported our households and population, but at the same time, we managed to support our energy industry and to prevent some non-payments. Uh, afterwards, government presented more targeted and comprehensive economic support package that also envisaged sectoral policy measures and the post COVID recovery actions together with needed activities to strengthen social safety nets. If we be, to be more precise, our first line of defense against these considerable risks is our commitment to sound macroeconomic and uh, financial uh, policies. The second phase of social support measures envisage provision of targeted social assistance to employed people who lost their job or were placed on a so-called unpaid leave uh, over the course of six months, we will support them. Also, one-time assistance to so-called self-employed or employed in informal sector, which uh, was quite a comprehensive and unusual measure because we are dealing with the gray sector of this self-employed, but we decided to uh, also to use this momentum to provide uh, certain uh, uh, stimulus for um, coming out these, uh, let's say, illegal operations and to register those micro uh, business activities and self-entrepreneurs. Besides, uh, state subsidy is provided for each maintained workplace. More precisely, salaries below certain amount will be fully or partially exempted from, uh, uh, from um, uh, personal income tax which is even a more important measure that, which allows businesses to keep uh, their personal and to share with us the burden of uh, costs for, for salaries and for keeping uh, employment. Also, I would like to touch upon uh, the certain measures of economic support uh, uh, that are more targeted and oriented, oriented at most vulnerable and affected economic sectors, including tourism industry, uh, which generated be before a crisis a lot of incomes for Georgia. Uh, you know that our GDP uh, is uh, 
uh, a little bit more than 16 billion USD, while incomes, annual income from tourism in 2019 was amounted to 3.3 billion USD. So it's a very significant and uh, valuable industry, of course, and it's our duty to support them. But at the same time, we do believe that Despite uh, the overall pessimism regarding tourism, we do believe that after COVID, Georgian tourism may uh, become even stronger, more, let's say, niche, uh, more safe, because, you know, we can uh, capitalize on our recent experience of our hospitality industry to deal with the safety issues, to deal with the quarantines, uh, to, to, to go more digitally, to switch to more distant uh, services, and also we have a numerous uh, unique uh, touristic products that might be more demanded now in a post-COVID world, like ecotourism, agrotourism, outdoor activities. Uh, so we're working on that and we do hope that again, our touristic industry probably uh, will be able to recover within the next uh, 12 months. And okay, let us see, we're quite uh, optimistic in this respect. So this is uh, all about, let's say, the immediate response to, uh, to the crisis. Of course, we have more, more detailed programs for SME sector, uh, financial support to address the short-term uh, uh, liquidity gap, to address the immediate need in working capital, to support uh, not only new borrowings and access to finance from the banks, but also the current loan portfolio for SMEs, but I think that this is a subject of future discussions and my deputy Gennady Arveladze, who is also presented here, will be able to elaborate more on that particular questions. So thank you very much once again for this excellent opportunity. Thank you, thank you. So uh, if, if I may uh, ask you, Stefan, about the situation in, uh, in Ukraine, in short, um, what do you think the key challenges for Ukraine and how, uh, what are the main programs uh, that you develop in collaboration with Ukraine to, to assist to their economy? And how you, you and, and they're just on the border of uh, European Union, so uh, just around the corner, right? So uh, is it uh, more helpful to assist a country like, a, because you have six countries in the Eastern partnership, so uh, for example, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan are much more remote countries. What are the advantages of Ukraine being closer to, uh, to uh, EU? And what are the programs that you develop now to tackle the pandemic uh, consequences? Well, thank you, Anatoly. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, I mean, I think the, the, the problems in, in Ukraine are, are quite similar to, to the problems faced by the other countries in the region and, uh, and all over Europe. I mean, in terms of challenges, I think, as Jerome said, I think there are, there are basically twofold. There's the immediate uh, sort of health challenge, if you like. I think there, uh, Ukraine, as also the minister said for Georgia, uh, managed uh, the situation uh, quite well. I mean, of course, we still have uh, uh, every day between 400 to 500 uh, new cases, but uh, the curve has, has, has not been uh, very steep. And uh, I think we are hopeful that, uh, that the situation uh, will, be, will be contained. Also in Ukraine, starting earlier this week, uh, restrictions were uh, were gradually uh, lifted, and I think it will be important now to, to manage this process in a, in a, in, in, in a responsible way, which uh, allows sort of economic uh, activities to, to recover, while, uh, while keeping in mind that, uh, that the, the risk, the danger of the pandemic is not yet over. And, uh, you know, I think the risk of a second wave uh, is, is, is a real one. And I think a too sort of uh, too fast opening, uh, uh, lifting of the restrictions also comes with, with risks. But I think what we see in Ukraine so far is, is indeed a, a gradual approach to that. The, the second big, big challenge, uh, of course, uh, is, is the economic one. Uh, predictions uh, in Ukraine, as for any other country, are that uh, we have a, a deep recession ahead. The government has put in place a comprehensive, I think, uh, support uh, package. And from our side, from the EU side, I think we have also, uh, I mean, we are trying to support that uh, 
with the full frame, we had a 190 million support package focusing on health on the one hand and socioeconomic recovery on the other hand. On top, uh, we have uh, major macro financial assistance coming. Yesterday, the Ukrainian parliament adopted in second reading the banking law that paved the way, I think, for the IMF program now to go ahead. Will unlock uh, an immediate 500 million macrofinancial assistance payment and another uh, new macrofinancial assistance program of uh, more than a billion uh, being uh, coming on stream uh, soon. Uh, so these are the two the two main uh, axes of our support. Uh, as part of the socioeconomic recovery, I think we have put a lot of emphasis on uh, you know on community resilience as we call it so working you know not only with government top down but also really at a local at a grassroots level with the gromadas the communities with civic actors uh, all over ukraine uh, and i think there are many good initiatives around you know online learning uh, but also providing help to to to, to the elderly who uh, particularly suffered from the confinement situation so I think it's a good and comprehensive uh, package that we develop with our Ukrainian partners and also in close cooperation with other international partners. Now, in terms of Ukraine, you know, being, uh, being uh, close to the EU, having common borders with four uh, EU member states, of course, it means that in terms of the moment the borders closed, air travel was uh, basically suspended. I think the immediate uh, impact was uh, was very substantial. There is also a large amount of Ukrainians working abroad, working in the EU. There is the issue of seasonal workers, where I think solutions are being found now, uh, also with with between Ukraine and the member states to 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 allow this to happen. Also this year, though probably not in the same uh, uh, in the same numbers as in previous years. Uh, and then then we will have to see. You know, when it comes to air travel, I think. Very slowly, uh, there are connections again being uh, being announced by the big airlines, but I think it will be another two to three months at least before we uh, we will be back to to some sort of of, of, of normal. Uh, that will also impact tourism, of course. Although for domestic tourism, there might be uh, new opportunities, uh, but uh, I think for the for the month uh, ahead, uh, it, it it will remain a very very challenging situation and uh, just coming back to what I've said at the beginning, I think it is important to keep in mind that, uh, that the, the situation remains uh, fragile and I think it will be uh, really essential going ahead to find the right balance between uh, sort of uh, allowing uh, economic activity to resume by keeping a very close uh, close eye on the on the way the, the, the pandemic develops to to make sure that the two sort of that the, the, the policies in response are, are calibrated in the correct way. Thank you. Thank you. And if I may ask a follow up question to Mr. Nava, uh, please, uh, to, uh, we, we, is there any advantage for Georgia to collaborate regionally with other Eastern partnership countries and EU to recover from the current uh, economic crisis? Because you have uh, other uh, neighbors, close neighbors like Armenia and Azerbaijan, does it provide you any advantage to cope with the pandemic? I would like to, to uh, let's say, to pass the floor to my <laughs> He will elaborate on that. Uh, hello, hello. hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It's my great pleasure uh, to be here uh, to participate in this very useful. Uh, uh, discussions. Um, uh, the uh, question was coming, what are the advantages if uh, Georgia can be uh, advantages of having the neighborhood of uh, Eastern partnership countries as well as also having good co collaboration uh, with the EU uh, as a whole. 
uh, I think uh, it has been shown a great uh, success uh, uh, already with the collaboration with Eastern Part all Eastern Partnership countries uh, as well as with the EU member countries, uh, especially during these uh, very challenging times. Uh, we have received uh, very big support uh, from the EU, financial uh, support, uh, which amounts around 400 uh, million uh, euros, uh, which is really very useful uh, and which uh, is already directed to support Georgia uh, in post-crisis after COVID-19, uh, as well as also uh, with the short-term uh, financing uh, those challenges which we have, have faced uh, during uh, pandemic uh, uh, times. Uh, what is uh, really important is that you proved itself uh, to be a very uh, good friend uh, and also uh, uh, had uh, used its all tools and programming to support Georgia during these challenging times. Uh, also, uh, it is really uh, very important uh, after the crisis uh, to uh, stimulate the economy uh, and to stimulate the economy it is uh, also important to receive such kind of support uh, from you side and we are very much grateful uh, for these uh, efforts uh, that uh, has shown uh, you side uh, already uh, we uh, we need to uh, i think uh, when uh, we are t talking about the advantages the location uh, where georgia is located is very important. Uh, having a very good uh, relationship with all its uh, neighbors uh, from Eastern Partnership countries uh, also helps to collaborate more to open uh, markets uh, and to facilitate trade exports uh, and uh, foreign direct investments uh, between these countries. Uh, so uh, here uh, it is really important with those partners uh, to have more market opening, more access uh, also for SMEs uh, to finance, uh, financing. Uh, and uh, this is also important to promote uh, the, uh, their exports. Uh, so here Georgia has good advantage of having uh, free uh, market access uh, for uh, all uh, Eastern Partnership countries. Uh, as well as also with the EU. So the collaboration uh, with this regard is very important. Uh, the continuation uh, of this uh, collaboration is very important. Uh, so uh, you know, we, we have uh, the advantage uh, uh, compared uh, to other Eastern Partnership countries, uh, also with the location, with the uh, skilled labor force, uh, and as well as also uh, some uh, advantage uh, of the low, low taxes, uh, the taxation system that we also offer. Yeah. Uh, with that regard, um, also it is important to develop the collaboration in transport field, in energy field uh, with those uh, countries uh, and more uh, collaboration, more uh, uh, high collaboration with this regard with those countries is uh, highly important. So this is where we see another uh, opportunity in terms of collaboration uh, with those uh, countries uh, to enhance connectivity. Uh, connectivity uh, was and will be very important uh, in this during these challenging times uh, in the field of transport, logistics, uh, and uh, I think not only Georgia but all the Eastern Partnership countries need to use their advantages uh, of their location because location now becomes one of the priority uh, after the crisis uh, in order to decrease the costs and also to increase the efficiency of the countries uh, in uh, production lines, uh, etc. Uh, and to uh, increase uh, also the uh, efficiency of the uh, production. Uh, also, uh, it is uh, here, uh, it is uh, important uh, for Georgia as in, uh, to mention uh, Georgia as an associated partner country uh, together with Ukraine and Moldova uh, who has uh, another advantages uh, in the region another advantage by having the uh, deep and comprehensive free trade area uh, with the European Union uh, with all Eastern partnership countries uh, as well as also uh, Georgia having one of the liberal uh, economy uh, trade trade regimes as well liberal trade regimes uh, 
and open market economy uh, as a whole. So this is uh, something which we will be using uh, as an advantage uh, in coming, uh, uh, coming months. Uh, also, uh, what is uh, important uh, here is that uh, we need to use also the, uh, uh, together with the deep and comprehensive free trade area, uh, the other four, uh, uh, the gradual opening uh, of four freedoms of single markets. Uh, which can become a strong political message uh, also to the associated partners who demonstrate uh, their readiness by their democratic credentials and successful economic reforms. So in addition, we need to accelerate uh, also implementation of new uh, potential infrastructure projects, which is foreseen under TNT. Uh, and TNT uh, is, um, a, you, you know, extended TNT uh, has core project lists uh, investment uh, projects which needs to be financed uh, and which is already on place uh, which I think uh, needs to be elaborated uh, and uh, also financing needs to be uh, to be done so I think uh, here the collaboration on TNT projects when we're talking about the connectivity enhanced connectivity uh, between uh, the Eastern Partnership partners and uh, EU uh, the TNT project, the extended TNT project needs uh, to be taken into consideration. Uh, here I need to bring, uh, when I'm talking uh, to exploit the connectivity potential, uh, to bring uh, as an example the Black Sea uh, connectivity uh, towards uh, the, for example, the developing feeder ferry connections uh, between Georgia uh, on the one part and Romania, Bulgaria and Ukraine on the other part. Uh, uh, as a way of increased regional transportation uh, and trade. Also, uh, to construct uh, the Black Sea underwater uh, uh, electricity transmission line is another uh, opportunity uh, which can be used uh, uh, in this regard between Georgia and Romania, for example, as a contribution uh, to energy security uh, and a strong incentive to develop uh, of renewable energy sector. Uh, the EU's active uh, interest uh, in developing uh, these projects will be decisive uh, for their realization. Uh, so uh, we think uh, also that uh, it needs uh, to elaborate more about uh, EU be between EU and partners uh, uh, the opportunity to establish uh, some platform, Eastern Partnership Investment Platform, uh, among uh, others to facilitate B2B uh, contact, uh, uh, con uh, contact support uh, and create a portal that uh, would share information on business investment opportunities and offer a proposal matching uh, system as well as also encourage direct contacts among SMEs uh, from uh, EU member states and uh, the partner countries. And uh, the last point uh, which I want to make uh, another uh, opportunity which we need to utilize together with our Eastern Partnership members is the digital uh, single market, which uh, may become another benchmark uh, for Eastern Partnership countries uh, to integrate. Uh, the aim, among others, is to achieve a common roaming space between uh, Eastern Partnership countries and the uh, European Union. Uh, so uh, I think uh, to also develop trust services uh, uh, which means uh, through mutual recognition of qualified electronic signature, stamp and other trust services, as well as also to improve uh, cyber security for a better resilience of uh, critical infrastructure and better personal data protection. And uh, as well as also to develop the e-health system, uh, which is uh, now very, becomes very, uh, very important uh, during these times. So uh, I think uh, with this, uh, I need to conclude. And uh, one last point which I want to make uh, is uh, to, uh, it is important between Eastern Partnership countries, uh, uh, as well as also between EU and Eastern Partnership countries to develop the e-customs, uh, which, uh, which will facilitate also the trade, e-logistics uh, and e-commerce uh, uh, in general. Thank you, uh, Gennady. And uh, let me introduce Gennady Arulaza. He replaced Mr. Nava, uh, his Deputy Minister of Economy. She had to leave for a meeting with uh, one of the big financial, international financial institutions. And we understand that it's 
important. So thank you for your uh, overview of the important points. And the question that I would like to address you, Jaren, is a little bit uh, more political. Uh, we understand that the countries are, uh, the six countries are different and the model of the economy and the political system is different. So in what, to what degree the political, uh, or uh, sorry, the economical uh, integration or the co uh, in economical uh, cooperation between those countries is dependent on the political integration of, in those countries and political reforms in these countries? Thank you for the question. Um, Am I hurt? I am on mute. Yes, okay, there you go. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that question indeed. And uh, by the way, it's very nice to hear um, the Deputy Minister um, and also the colleague from the Ministry of Economy talk uh, and very much repeat uh, the objectives of the recently uh, adopted uh, joint communication. Uh, I think we're very much on the same page when it comes to what should be the priorities for the next, uh, for the next five years. Um, now, when it comes to the Eastern Partnership, and as you rightly say, there is uh, quite a divergence uh, in, um, uh, let's say, the political structures, but also the ambitions of the different partners vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the EU. Um, I think we have on the one hand, uh, and it's nicely shown when we see colleagues from Georgia with an EU flag uh, behind talking, we have the associated uh, countries for whom uh, we have uh, very far-reaching agreements, associated uh, association agreements and uh, DCFDAs. On the other hand of the spectrum, if you want, um, we have uh, countries like uh, uh, Azerbaijan and Belarus. Um, Azerbaijan, we do have an agreement dating from 1996. Uh, Belarus. Uh, we are trying to reach an agreement on the first step towards coming to an agreement, which is the partnership priorities. Um, and in between that, those two extremes, you have uh, uh, Armenia with a, sort of like a hybrid uh, construct with a comprehensive and enhanced partnership agreement, taking quite a few elements of the association agreement and the DCFTAs. Um, but tailoring it, of course, uh, in line with its uh, choice to be part of the Eurasian uh, Economic Union. And hence, the trade part in particular um, is uh, somewhat different from uh, those that uh, we have in the associated uh, countries. Um, so that's the spectrum, indeed, that we're working on. And I think the, uh, the new policy uh, that we hope to uh, discuss on the 18th of June when we are having our Eastern Partnership Summit, although it still hasn't been decided if it will take place uh, or not. Uh, if it will take place on the 18th of June, it's very clear it's going to be a similar type of format than the one we're having now, i.e. Uh, virtual. There's no way that uh, uh, we would be able to get uh, 6 plus 27 uh, leaders to come together to, uh, to Brussels. Um, but I think it's important that um, uh, the Eastern Partnership policy is uh, sufficiently relevant for all six um, and sufficiently inclusive. And that has been, I think, the, uh, the challenge working on this new Eastern Partnership policy. And we did that on the basis of a broad and inclusive consultation um, that we, uh, uh, we organized in the pre-lockdown times between October uh, sorry, between uh, May and October last year. Um, and I think what we have put in place is a clear agenda that is uh, um, uh, very much in line with what uh, the Ministry of Economy from Georgia was indicating. So focusing on the economy and on connectivity, but also making the economy more green. And I think this aspect is going to be reinforced in the post-COVID uh, uh, context. Uh, supporting rule of law, very important. I heard a little bit less, um, maybe understandably, from the Ministry of Economy's uh, side, but this is also key when it comes to attracting foreign investment to support the rule of law agenda. Supporting the green agenda and seeing how we can convert the green transition also in the Eastern Partnership. Digitalization, as mentioned by the Georgian counterparts, as well as supporting broadly youth, society, civil society, public administration reform. These are all building blocks to strengthen resilience uh, in the countries. Um, and then when it comes to the associated countries where we, where we see this big ambition 
to move forward. Um, what what we say is, um, and I think this has also been recently, actually this Monday, um, uh, has been confirmed in the council conclusions that were adopted, um, where the European aspirations are very clearly recognized of these three associated uh, countries. Uh, but at the same time, we should not forget that we have um, uh, a big reform agenda ahead of us. The associated, the association agreement and the DCFDAs represent roughly 70% of the acquis. And uh, let's first make sure that we get um, uh, well underway in the implementation. I think it's important, particularly in the current context with COVID, where everything is different, that we keep the eye also on the longer term reform ball. And then, um, let's say, um, with enhanced sectoral cooperation, which is the, I think, the new element in the in the new Eastern Partnership policy, um, we will be able to, I think, have um, elements that are um, sufficiently interesting for all six, uh, and sufficiently attractive also for the associated three. Thank you, Jurian. I, I just uh, to be more specific. Uh, thank you for your uh, uh, your answer. But we have an examples in those countries where uh, you uh, provide an assistance which is conditioned, not unconditioned. For example, mm -hmm. in Belarus, as we know, uh, the sixty million, I think, uh, are conditioned that they should uh, somehow get to lockdown and to get in line with the World Health, uh, Health Organization, right? And I think that there may be some other. Uh, assistance programs which are conditioned by some political conditions. So if you may just provide some examples and to explain them how it works. When the po economical assistance is dependent on political integration or some po political conditions in those countries. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure that it's exactly correct what you're saying about uh, the 60 million euro assistance uh, to Belarus, which is indeed the, let's say, the bilateral package of the COVID response is conditional to uh, social distancing. Um, uh, it is, uh, let's say, it depends a little bit on what type of assistance you are talking about. For mm -hmm. instance, when we deal with uh, the provision of uh, liquidity to small and medium-sized enterprises in Belarus, uh, we're not going to ask uh, social distancing as a condition. Um, also, we are, I mean, let's also look at um, the situation in Belarus is, is a bit atypical, uh, I would say, compared to the other uh, six Eastern Partnership countries. I mean, uh, Stefan explained clearly how is the situation in Ukraine. Also, the situation in Georgia was very well explained. And I think it's relatively similar, actually, um, also in the other, uh, uh, th the other three countries minus uh, Belarus. So lockdown measures and already a certain reflection about easing. Uh, in Belarus, that indeed is not taking place. Um, and we've seen also the pandemic reaching uh, the highest level in Belarus, higher than, uh, than Ukraine, despite the fact that it has much less uh, inhabitants, it has much less uh, infections. Um, at the same time, it doesn't mean that nothing is happening uh, because um, uh, it's quite interesting to see how um, civil society is organizing itself uh, in Belarus and we have seen uh, how, for instance, uh, crowdfunding is taking place uh, to ensure that people uh, are getting um, uh, the, uh, the protective equipments they need, both citizens and in the health sector, um, but also um, how people start actually to do global social distancing without the authorities asking this from the, from the top. Uh, if you look at the Google data, uh, which these days is a very good proxy indicator of social distancing, Belarus is actually um, uh, doing less good in social distancing than the other five partner countries, but not doing, it's, it's, there's a clear difference between the social distancing uh, uh, now and a few months ago. So the message does get through. Um, on um, uh, on that side as well. Now, when it comes to the package for, for Belarus, when it comes to political conditionalities, um, I really think we are making quite a uh, we are making quite a distinction between this unprecedented context of COVID um, and let's say normal conditions. So, what we are, uh, for instance, are putting in place in many countries, including Georgia, 
uh, including Armenia, is uh, what we call uh, COVID resilience contracts, but budget supports. Normally, budget supports have very stringent conditions, uh, indeed, related to uh, the ambitions of the government itself. It's not a unilaterally imposed European Commission condition. This is something we do in dialogue. The authorities have an interest to undertake certain reforms. We are supporting them. And in supporting this, these reforms, we just agree on certain targets that are already in line with the government's policies. So for the COVID-19 resilience contracts, these conditionalities have been put much lower than what we would normally do. So I think in terms of conditionalities, I don't think it's fair to say that there are high political conditionalities to make sure that the support reaches the final beneficiaries. Our intention really is to make sure that our six Eastern Partnership countries, our neighbors, are coming out of this crisis in the best uh, possible way. And of course, when it comes to the specific example of Belarus, we do consistently uh, give clear messages to the authorities that they need to take care of certain key WHO recommendations, but not at the cost of not providing any assistance whatsoever. I, I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you, Jorian. So if, if I may address a question to uh, you, Stefan, uh, about what is the contribution of the Eastern partners themselves to the global fight against coronavirus? So if you can look on, on Ukraine, you've had some hackathon for some, uh, some IT initiatives. It was, as I remember, uh, set up by the Minister, Ministry of Digital Transformation of Ukraine, uh, trying to find some uh, technological solutions to this pandemic or some solutions that would assist. So what on your, uh, Ukraine is a huge country with a very diverse economy. So what do you think are solutions that come from Ukraine and could be helpful to all the countries because it's a global pandemic? I think there are a couple of areas. I mean, definitely the IT sector, which is very uh, thriving and uh, and dynamic, and uh, I think that's you know in a in a globalized world that is that is 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 happening. And uh, I think Ukrainian IT engineers uh, are very much uh, at the forefront of of the global effort in finding uh, digital solutions. Uh, another example, I think, is there were Ukrainian doctors and nurses that uh, that went to Italy. To help fight the pandemic there, but also, you know, I mean, uh, learn to some extent how the uh, how the uh, uh, disease sort of manifested itself and and and, and brought that uh, knowledge and expertise back. Uh, lastly, you know, there is uh, the Antonov uh, company, largest uh, freight plane in, in in the world, uh, and which is already, uh, I think, in 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 use to 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 transport. Uh, uh, you know, equipment items that is that is that is needed, and uh, you know the the vice prime minister has uh, in Ukraine, Mr. Pestaiko has also you know facilitated contact with the company. Uh, they are speaking also with WHO, uh, and I think they are more than ready to put also you know this uh, this resource at the disposal of the international community to help uh, you know transporting goods uh, uh, quickly and efficiently, and that's something that also we hope uh, will, will benefit from in the context in particular of the, uh, of the, of the program uh, with WHO that will benefit all the six Eastern Partnership countries and that Jeroen and myself will actually discuss uh, tomorrow uh, in detail with the, with, the, uh, with, the, uh, with the WHO further, and which is one of the flagship programs of the EU's uh, package. One other element, if I may, um, Anatoly, what is of course uh, uh, important, yes, connectivity, uh, uh, digital solutions, but I think this crisis has also shown that also local value chains are important. Uh, domestic production, and I don't mean uh, protectionist measures here, but I mean the, uh, the capabilities also in country to produce certain uh, key items and not uh, uh, be uh, too dependent. And secondly, uh, very briefly commenting on the, you know, the, the economic focus, Green Deal, innovative, digital is all very important. But I think the, uh, the situation, the crisis has also shown how important strong institutions are uh, in the health sector in that area. And I think this is actually where the governance agenda meets the economic agenda. Uh, and I think also for the future, both of the Eastern Partnership uh, you know, policy, but also the, the, the reform process in all the countries, 
and that's a that's really a key a key element to take forward because strong institutions uh, can manage crises much more efficiently than uh, than weak institutions. Thank you, uh, Stefan. And now just a a we, all those Eastern Partnership countries were always dreaming and talking about the new Marshall Plan. It's uh, there, at least part of them, like Ukraine, uh, you know, uh, maybe better than I do. They're dreaming about massive investment in a, a, a um, reindustrialization of Ukraine and maybe some others. Now, as a result of this uh, pandemic, some of the US and also European producers started thinking about not being um, a dependent on single supplier like China and tried to start thinking how they could relocate the production uh, closer to their borders, either to EU countries themselves or to countries like Ukraine, maybe Moldova, Belarus, Georgia or others. So what do you think? Do, do you think it's doable or it just the pandemic was too short for now, hopefully, so people would not uh, break their habits? Uh, is it doable? Uh, let's start with you, Stefan, and then uh, we'll pass to... Uh, we, we have uh, six minutes left, so let's try to... Uh, with a short answer, what do you think about this perspective? I think the pandemic has highlighted very starkly all over the world the need for, you know, domestic or, or sort of regional sort of production capacities of key items. And I, I think... Uh, uh, all over Europe, definitely, this is on top of the agenda, and I think we will see that happening. And I think that will benefit the countries, but also, you know, Europe, uh, Europe as a whole. So I'm, uh, I'm quite optimistic that we will see some, uh, some real uh, progress there in the, in the coming, uh, coming months and, and years. To be very brief. Thank you. And uh, to you, Gennady, uh, what do you think uh, if? you would you choose if the choice was in your hands what would you encourage uh, european investors what kind of uh, production way to to build up in georgia maybe textile maybe some others what what would be your advice if you would be an advisor to those investors uh, sure thank you for this question uh, yeah we are uh, as i have mentioned try to be short. okay we have short yeah. time as I have already mentioned, we are uh, living in very challenging times. Uh, so uh, now there is, uh, with those challenges, there are also the new opportunities. Uh, as you have mentioned, like the, the multinational companies are thinking about relocation uh, from one country to another country. Uh, I, I don't think that full relocation can be possible, uh, but there will be some uh, uh, value chains where Georgia can have uh, very good competitive advantage. We think that uh, we need to concentrate with the existing sectors, which we have been promoting uh, until now, as well as also aid some of the new sectors where we see there, there, are, ch chain, uh, there are chances uh, for Georgia to attract uh, businesses to invest uh, in Georgia. Those are, uh, for example, uh, the computer appliances, electronic, uh, appliances uh, where we see that for manufacturing uh, such uh, electronic uh, and computer uh, uh, appliances uh, can be Georgia can be the right place uh, to invest and produce uh, also uh, we think that footwear and apparel uh, can be another uh, sector where we can concentrate to mobilize uh, based on the experience that Georgia has in this uh, direction, uh, the skilled labor force, uh, experienced labor force, uh, and also uh, all these uh, opportunities that Georgia offers with its location, uh, with this uh, 2.3 billion consumer market with uh, duty-free access uh, to those markets, as well as also the well-developed public services, uh, easy to do a business, uh, its rankings, international rankings, uh, as well as also the location. Location, location is very important. Uh, and Georgia, I think, needs to uh, position uh, to its geographic location uh, to leverage uh, uh, it and offer investors a near-shoring location with a high level of safety. Uh, so this will be uh, our uh, uh, like concentration, uh, as well as also here we have been already identified around 400 uh, investors. Uh, companies uh, worldwide uh, with whom we will be talking and uh, 
uh, attracting the investments, FDIs, uh, from them and uh, also offering Georgia as an uh, investment uh, destination for their uh, productions. Uh, uh, also, uh, we will be expanding, and last point, and I'm f finishing, I know I'm limiting uh, in time. Uh, with, uh, we are expanding, uh, expanding our efforts to work with location advising consultants uh, as, and sector associations across the world. So this will be the target, how we will be uh, dealing with uh, uh, attracting uh, more and more investments. Uh, as I have mentioned already, we have already targeted companies, uh, which is around 400 companies worldwide with whom we will be talking and uh, attracting them. I thank you. Thank you, Gennady. And uh, Jeremy, to you, back to you. So what do you think, uh, uh, is there an opportunity for on those hectic times for uh, the countries uh, who are members of Eastern Partnership to, for example, for some of them to rebuild their industry and to become a suppliers for uh, EU countries, for some of them to build some kind of industry from the scratch? Yeah, thank you very much. I think that's, uh, I, I very much agree with Stefan that this issue of local value chains and supply chains have come much more to the fore. And I think once this health part of the pandemic is over, we will start to rethink there is a need to stay interconnected, but to also diversify. And there, I think uh, the Eastern Partnership could certainly help. I also think that we will, what we will see in the EU um, and I hope this is not wishful thinking, is a greening of, uh, of the industry and a greening of the enterprises and a greening of the economy. And I think it's equally important if we want to stay interconnected that this same transition, green transition that we will see in the EU and hopefully getting accelerated in uh, the wake of the pandemic, that we will see this also reflected in, um, in the Eastern Partnership countries. I think it's particularly important for those with association uh, agreements and DCFDAs to ensure that there is seamless trade between the EU and the Eastern Partnership to not miss the boat on this greening agenda. Thank you very much and uh, let me thank again for joining us today. I think it was really fruitful conversation and I hope that they will, the lockdown will come to its end and we'll keep developing our programs in this region and make it a better place to live in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a very interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good day. Bye bye. Have a good day. Bye bye.